Israel, the Lord your God will make you abundantly, abundantly prosperous in all your undertakings, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your soil. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you, just as he delighted in prospering your ancestors. When you obey the Lord your God by observing his commandments and decrees that are written in this book of the law, because you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too far from you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from Colossians 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for whom we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus. Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the world, the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Ephesus, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. As you bear fruit in every good work, and as you grow in the knowledge of God, may you be strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints of the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, 
And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. My message this morning is going to be looking at the gospel and that aspect about being a good neighbor. Now to start off, I want to ask how many of you have traveled to a foreign land where you did not know the language or the customs of that land when you got there? Almost everyone. Now I'm assuming that once you got there, somebody acted as that good neighbor and helped you out helped you make train reservations or get tickets or understand what was on the menu so you didn't order something that you wouldn't like, right? Most people found somebody that was willing to help them as a good neighbor. Churches are similar in that respect, that we have kind of our own language and our own cultures. And I'm sure that many of us may have grown up in the Episcopal Church and many of us may have come from some other church, some other denomination. How many came from a different denomination? Almost everyone. Wow, that's amazing. So, which denominations do we have represented? Presbyterian? Church of Christ. Church of Christ. Church of Christ. Catholic? Fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. Greg, what did you say? Roman. Roman Catholic? Southern Baptist. Catholic? Back here? Methodist? All right, so in most of these churches, we're all Christian churches, so there are certain things that, yes, are common to all churches, right? So there's usually some music and singing. Well, except for the Church of Christ folks, there's not music. There's definitely singing. They don't have any musical instruments. They just sing a cappella. So that's very different from, like, the church in the Episcopal Church. We have organ or piano, and sometimes there's a praise band in some churches. Fundamentalists or some of those have praise bands, yeah. Uh, so there's that. Now, usually there's also some prayer that goes on. And sometimes, like we you often use, a scripted prayer. Other places, it's more free form. As the Spirit moves you, you were to hold up folks for prayer or say your prayers out loud. Uh, there's usually a message, uh, a sermon of some kind. Sometimes it's a very long message. Sometimes it's like an extended Bible study in some places. And sometimes they're a little bit on the shorter side. Sometimes they're funny and sometimes they're inspirational. But there's usually a sermon. There's usually some sort of baptism ceremony. Uh, in some places it's a full immersion. Baptists, wherever you were, <laughs> Baptist, it's full immersion. They want you to get in the water and go completely under. In other places, we use a font where the water is poured over the head. So that's a little bit different from church to church. So you've got all these differences that are also held in common. It's just a different way of doing it, a different culture about it. Now, for those of you who came from a different denomination and into the Episcopal Church, did somebody act as a good neighbor and help you out on the first time? Yes? <laughs> yes? Yes? No, not so much? You had to kind of find your own way. So when you did come into the Episcopal Church, and it being quite different from the Church of Christ, um, or other churches, other denominations, was it a good experience? Clearly you stayed, you're here. <laughs> but hopefully there was that person, that somebody who eventually, maybe not on the first visit, but eventually helped you to understand what goes on. And it's important for us, because we've been here for a while now, but we kind of got the gist of how things go. We know what the order of service is like. We know where things are on the campus. But those that are new to our community, to our church, to our worship, they may not have that same sense of where things are and how things are done. And as good neighbors, we should keep our eyes open for that. Because I know when, when I try and look at things through the eyes of somebody who does not know this property, and I drive in and I go, okay, there's two buildings. <laughs> One of those is a church. Can't really tell from here because the signs are small and they're hard to read. And once you kind of figure out, okay, well, that's where everybody's going. So I guess it's that one. Where do I park? Once I get inside, 
well, okay, I come in through there, but the church is, how do I get there from here? Where's the restroom? And if I make it all the way into the church itself, then I might have questions about um, the service itself. Did I pick up a bulletin? Did I know to pick up a bulletin? Uh, if I didn't get one, where are they? Where can I find them? Is it going to be a projected service? No, apparently not. Then there's these books in the pew racks. What are these? Book of Common Prayer. I have no idea what that's about. Um, so there's all these questions that new people might have. We go to sing a song, they might pick up the wrong hymnal. They don't know that G means gather. So those kinds of things, it's, it's good for us to keep our eyes open and to help when we notice we've got somebody new and give them that, that guidance, that help. Now, we as Episcopalians, and, and this church in particular, but all Episcopalians, the motto of the church is the Episcopal Church welcomes you. And there's no asterisk after you. There's no footnote that says except. When we say we welcome you, we mean we welcome anyone, everyone, all of you. There's no exceptions to that. And we need to remember that some of the people that might come to visit us are going to come for different reasons. Some are just curious. Some are new to town looking for a place to, to worship. Some are coming to hear what it is that we preach, what do we say, how do we do our worship services, and others are going to come maybe from some of those other denominations or other churches where, to borrow from our gospel reading, they've kind of been spiritually mugged. They've been beaten up a little bit. They've been verbally uh, assaulted, if you will, by those other churches who maybe made them feel less than, judged, characterized that they're not right kind of people. They don't lead the right kind of life. They're not maybe the right uh, uh, lifestyle. They may not be uh, living uh, a godly life. And they've been ostracized. They've been kind of pushed to the edges or ignored even. Like the priest and the Levite walking around the man that they see wounded. They just kind of go around and they ignore him. And we need to be the kind of people that the Good Samaritan, the good neighbor, is. That we notice when people come in, and we may not see the wounds and the bruises that they may have from having been through something traumatic to them on their spiritual journey. You know, they're just trying to do the same thing we are. They're trying to figure out what it is that God wants us to do in this life, and they're trying to lead their life in a godly way, and somebody has kind of knocked them down. We need to be conscious of that and maybe give them a little help, a little inspiration. Give them some space to know that you are welcome here. Now Jesus, he's our example. He's our teacher. And you'll notice that throughout the scriptures, anyone who came to him, he never turned them away. Didn't matter where they were coming from, what they had going on in their lives, he never turned anyone away. And at the end of our gospel lesson today, when he asked the man, so who do you think was the good neighbor? And he says, the one who showed that person mercy. Jesus says, go and do likewise. That's what we're called to do. Keep our eyes open for those around us and show them how we can be good neighbors to them. Go and do likewise. Amen. Amen.